are podcasters. Um, I have a podcast called The Longest Shortest Time, which is about family. Um, and Greta, uh, wanna, what's your number? Tell who you are. Sure. So I yeah, run a podcast so production company called Transit Media, and we make podcasts for a variety of partners, including ESPN's 30 for 30. Um, so we were very excited when they asked us to tell the story of this really important moment for the so how many people are familiar with the story behind this photo here? Oh, a good number of you. Wonderful. This case is easier. <laughs> okay, so we all know um, there were six brave women who sat their tushies down um, in Central Park uh, in 1972 to, um, to protest uh, the fact that the um, AAU, the American Athletic Union, the am the Amateur Athletic Union, sorry, am I saying it right? The Amateur Athletic Union was um, was making uh, women run ten minutes after men. So, um, sorry, yes. So women were there was a separate starting time for women. That was the AAU had determined. So they would run ten minutes. And they would start 10 minutes before the men. Um, and for quite some time, the longest distance that women were allowed to run was about a mile and a half. Mm -hmm. So the marathon at 26 plus was much, much farther than the Amateur Athletic Union would allow women to run. Yes. Thank you for the correction. It was a slip, slip of the tongue. I've been working on this story for several months. Um, so um, so in, in a little bit, we're going to bring up um, two women who played a big role in making this moment possible, um, as well as Paul, who also helped behind the scenes. So, um, but first, we're going to talk about the making of this documentary. Um, so, Greta, what drew you to wanting to do this story? Well, I mean, first of all, the opportunity to tell a story about women who were heroes and feminist pioneers was an incredible opportunity, right? But I think also what really struck us was that women were not allowed to run, right? So, or women were not allowed to run equally as men. And as we started to dig into this story, it was quite fascinating to learn too, for us, you know, in the 1970s, that running was not considered a normal kind of everyday fitness thing. And so, as we started to dig in and we started to talk with people, we learned, first of all, runners were kind of perceived a little bit like as freaks. Um, and one piece of archival tape that we unearthed was there was a doctor on a sort of like PBS news show and the host was asking him like, should people run? And he said, oh no, well, you know, you could die. <laughs> and so there was this perception that running was not something to do for fitness, it was dangerous. And so being dangerous, it definitely was not going to be inclusive of women. Right, and another thing we learned that doctors were telling at the time was that women should not run long distances because their uteruses might fall out. And, um, and this was especially interesting to me um, as somebody who does a lot of reporting on the on, uh, women's reproductive health. Yep. Um, uterine prolapse is a thing that uh, can happen in childbirth and the thing that the doctors were saying was uh, you won't be able to bear children because if you run, then you will have uterine prolapse, which is just not how it works. And we do that um, so, you know, and the other thing is that it makes me wonder, like, what what do we think now about women's bodies? That we'll find out, you know, 30 years down the line. But, um, so, uh, so, so, Greta and I um, are not, like, runners, but I think been sort of inspired by the story of these women um, to run a little bit. I just ran my first 5K. Um, Yay! Yeah, or, uh, about a month ago, and I signed up for my next one right away so that I wouldn't fall off the wagon. How about you, Greta? Um, I run around my neighborhood. I started a few years ago, and I've, I've done some, I've done a 5K with the New York Runners Club. Um, and so feeling connected to the sport, feeling connected to the story of like training and endurance and perseverance was something to also really attract me to the story. So, um, you know, I think we were talking about it earlier and I think that the idea that we would even think that running is a form of exercise that we can 
do, but who could walk outside our doors and run for exercise is really made possible by the women you see in this photo and others in, the, in that community. Um, and there is a woman who many of you know, um, who, whose story was made um, incredibly well known by a series of photographs um, from the Boston Marathon, um, the, 19, the 1967 Boston Marathon, um, in which Jock Semple, who was um, running, what, 1968, 67, 67, yes, we, we fact checked this. <laughs> Because in running, men have always been welcoming to us. Okay, you know everybody thinks that men hated women runners, and Jock Semple was the embodiment of that when he rushed out on the course and attacked me in the race. He was an angry official who was overworked, stressed, and felt that I was making a mockery of his race. He didn't know anything about me. Didn't know that women were training and working hard to run. And my coach was screaming at him, "Leave her alone. She's okay. I've trained her." But the reality is, is that the, the men in running have always welcomed us. I don't think, is there a woman here who's had a hard time from another male, a male runner? I don't think any of us have. And the community was really tight anyway. It wasn't just that the, the women's running community was very tight and small, but the, even the men's was odd, tight, small. We all knew each other, all over the world we knew each other. And um, I think Boston was, was the moment, for instance, we would, or New York, we would show up um, and, and it, we would have our family together. That, so that was important. But you asked a question specifically about women. And the fact is, is that um, there were very few of us, and there were very few of us who could go to Boston. Um, and, and because for many people it was a long trip, and, and if you were a runner in California, it was an expensive trip. Yeah. But we all knew each other. We kept in touch through email, not email, so news, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I meant to say newsletters. We had these memeographed newsletters, and we 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 cherished these these publications. So we knew, knew what everybody was doing, and we would write to each other. In particular, at Boston, though, we always had an annual uh, get together usually with the Roadrunners Club of America, because the AAU was very, very unsupportive of a lot of things we were doing, so men and women. Um, and, and it was an organization that always said no, whereas the Roadrunners always said yes. So we would get there, but we, we knew each other. We were friends, uh, but we were also rivals. I mean, Nina and I were, were going back and forth a lot in those early years, especially in the 70s, and um, so we were competitive. But you know what? Nobody ran in those days unless they wanted to be good. We all wanted to be good. And the thing that separated the men from the boys, and there was no female equivalent, so we took that, um, was three hours in the marathon, which is really a very, very substantial um, you know, uh, aspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and we felt if we could get just get under three hours in the marathon, we would be part of the group. So we, we competed hard against each other, and we kept pushing our limits. But we were really proud of ourselves, and I think the guys were really proud of us because we were pushing those barriers for everybody. And we couldn't understand why people didn't believe that the road wasn't big enough for all of us, because it is. 
And, um, and we all knew that if you worked hard enough, you would improve. And anybody who worked hard and improved was, was worthy of sharing the road. What kinds of things would you write about in those letters? Uh, oh, no, we say, say something like, um, um, uh, Dear um, Petey, that uh, is Elaine Peters, who's passed away. Dear Petey, did you see what, uh, what, what uh, 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 Nina did? Oh my God, you know, under three hours. Or, or uh, and, and then we, we would uh, also say, listen, are you gonna come to Boston? Let's get together, um, let's, let's plan what we're gonna do. Uh, what races are you gonna be doing? Let's show up at the same races. Let's be there together. Um, and, and, and sometimes afterwards, we, we would always talk, um, and we'd be very free-spirited afterwards when we were talking, as everybody is after you run a, a long race because your endorphins are flying around. Um, and we would, we, would, we would really kind of still be revealing the secrets of our soul. I'll never forget when a few times a New York Times journalist would be leaning and listening to the conversation and then we'd see it in the paper the next day. Um, one time in particular, I don't think Nina and mind my story about our divorces, right? Um, so so Nina, <laughs> Nina, Nina and I, uh, Nina broke up with her husband and I had left my husband just about the same time. And we were all talking with Paul and a group of guys Afterwards, we said, yeah, you know, it's really interesting when a woman starts running, she gets her own sense of independence and strength and doesn't tolerate a bad relationship anymore. Mm -hmm. We have the courage to leave and go forge out on our own. And we were talking about that. And, that. Um, and then Jerry Esplanazzi, the reporter from the New York Times, just happened to be listening in. And then, then and if we said in the first paragraph, two women runners from New York revealed yesterday that they're getting divorces. And, um, and my, my ex, actually hadn't heard yet so <laughs> so the next day the next day at work his boss comes in and said um i think maybe you better get this sorted out wow, <laughs> wow. well i see you have a number there yeah yeah talk about that a little will bit. you talk about the number i recognize that number from the story we okay it well up. everybody knows this old number from the boston marathon that's not the real one it's an exact replica but you see the corner is torn off um, and this is the one I had on my back. So Jock Semple missed the one on my front. I lunged away from him. He grabbed me by my sweatshirt, pulled me back, and, and swiped again like this. And he caught the corner of this one on my back. So all through the race, this number was flapping. But I kept those numbers, and I finished the race, which was the, probably the most important decision in my life. Um, and when you make the most important decision in your life when you're 20, it, it, it was an awesome moment for me. Um, and I think that's because I've been running most of my life and gave me that sense of empowerment, courage to make a tough decision. But at any rate, um, who would ever believe, this was three digits as far as I was concerned, right? For, for 47 years. And all of a sudden, the number starts coming to me through the internet with, with men and women uh, both writing to me and saying this number makes me feel fearless. Um, and I said, isn't that nice? You know, this is from Paraguay, it was from Poland, it was from Chicago, and from, uh, you know, the Basque country. I mean, people who'd never met each other before were saying the same thing. I'm wearing 261 on my back tomorrow in the Tokyo Marathon because it makes me feel fearless. Then they started sending me pictures of their tattoos. I mean, I got the creeps, really. Uh, because, because what in the world would, you know, when you tattoo yourself, it's really significant. Suddenly I realized, I realized that um, when you feel fearless, you feel like you can do anything, and running does that for us. And I guess everybody in the world has been told you're not welcome at one time or the other, or you're the wrong race, or the wrong religion, or you're not cool, or you're, you're too fat, or you're too slow. Or, you know, we've heard that as women all the time, eh, you're not a real athlete. We've heard that over and over again. Then you go run and you are fearless. You can do anything. And that's why we took that number and turned it into a nonprofit called 261 Fearless. Got it right there, um, which is going around the world showing women who have no opportunities how to take the first step and just go out the door and find their fearlessness. So we're very excited about what's happened in the, in the last two or three years. This 501c3 is already in the nine countries, so we're really excited. Speaking of not being welcome, one thing that we uncovered as we were working on this story was this idea of women contaminating the race for men. So in the 70s, the AAU, one of the reasons why women were not allowed to run was because it would contaminate the race, and it would people who were running would be ruled ineligible, their times would be thrown out. Can you talk a little bit about that and that word and what that felt like? 
Okay, first of all, the, the, the audience is sort of po-faced over this because the a Amateur Athletic Union was the governing body of our sport and you couldn't run unless you joined the AAU and paid a an, uh, membership fee. Yep. And then that membership fee and entitled you to a, a membership number and when you entered a race, you had to show this membership number and pay your entry fee. I mean, these were like 50 cents and $2 for Boston was $2 entry fee, um, you can imagine. Um, yeah. Uh, but the rules of the Amateur Athletic Union were extremely strict on many points. You could not accept anything more to go to a race than expense money. The prize couldn't exceed a value of like $10, and you could, you could be a professional because they thought professionals would taint the sport. And there were other infractions as well, okay? Um, like, uh, like when my boyfriend hit the official, he got expelled because he hit an official. You know, that's quite obvious, aren't they? But this, the contamination rule was, if somebody who had violated a rule in the amateur athletic union, whatever it was, let's say he took money and he showed up at a race, he contaminated the whole field. Therefore, it was, um, it was like being excommunicated from the church is what it was like. And, um, but the contamination rule spilled over with the women's thing, which was hilarious. Like, who else are we going to run with, right? And, um, and, and it sounds kind of icky, you know, contaminated. Um, anyway, the guys thought it was hilarious, but the rule was that if women then ran in the Boston Marathon, every guy in the Boston Marathon would be eligible to be disqualified from the Amateur Athletic Union and therefore the Boston Marathon and never be allowed to run in any race or take a collegiate scholarship. That's how stupid it was, but it's scary because some, sometimes you want to make an Olympic team. And if you can't be a member of your federation, you don't even get to go to the Olympic trials. So, so they really had an iron hold on the athletes. And people like Steve Prefontaine and, and, and Frank Shorter and Bill Rogers really pushed those limits very, very hard and, and broke, broke down a lot of those barriers, as did we women in the women's rule. And what were your thoughts at the time before this um, sit-down was planned? What were your thoughts about how to fight back? Well, I think the best way we fought back was we showed up. We showed up and we kept running. When, when um, I was thrown out of the Boston Marathon, by the way, there were no rules saying women shouldn't run or couldn't run the marathon. And there was nothing about gender on the entry form. It was my coach who insisted I officially sign up for the race. He said, Boston's a serious race. You know, it's like the Olympics. You've got to sign up. You've got to pay your entry fee. You've got to get your medical certificate. I did all of those things. He had to get travel permits for us to go, all right? Um, and then when I was expelled, DQ'd and expelled after the race, um, disqualified DQ, but expelled from the Amateur Athletic Union, we showed up anyway. And Nina showed up, and then uh, 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 Sarah Mae Berman showed up, and we just jumped in the race. And you know, there's a lot of people in the race, and I'd be able to police every woman who's jumping in the race. And finally it became a joke, because Nina and Sarah Mae Berman were pushing to break three hours. Now that was pretty damn good for a guy. And when they were racing neck to neck, the journalists got very interested in what the women could do and began covering us and writing, when is the AAU gonna you know, get over the silliness and let these women run? So that was the biggest thing we did. But we banded together. Um, we, um, we worked hard within our federations. Nina took on uh, a, a head of a, a long distance running for the New York Long, long Island area. I was the chair of women's long distance running uh, in the Niagara district and up in Syracuse, the Buffalo area. Um, it didn't exist, so we created it. Um, but you had to work, we decided to work also within the system to change the system. And we also worked very strongly with the Roadrunners Club of America because they were totally on our side. Yep. And we, we, with the pressure mounted. And finally, uh, by 1972, the Boston Marathon was the first big race to tumble uh, and had to, and had to, it was legislated, admit women into the race. But that took five years from 1967. And weren't you, um, between there, you were still running um, and receiving unofficial trophies? Oh, yes, Can you talk about story. those? What, what, yeah. what were those like? Well, there are two hilarious stories. After I got kicked out of the AAU and DQ'd for Boston in 67, so virtually now I'm a pirate, right? Um, uh, I got, my first invitation was the next day, and I was invited to a race in Canada. And I said, right. It was like, it was a Vietnam War area, Thera. And a lot of American boys were burning their draft cards and going across the border and living in Canada to get away from the Vietnam War. 
it was a way of protesting and it was a way of, of also they were conscientious objectors in many cases who couldn't get conscientious objector status. So I took my AAU card, burned it, and I went to Canada also and ran. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, up yours, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, and then, uh, but then um, the invitations, I'm sure for Nina too, we got invited everywhere to races, and I'm sure the race director loved the publicity. Girl in the race, you know? And, and if I, you look back at history, I mean, almost every dinky road race that ever was in New York State or on the East Coast, you know, um, the Beat Run, the Onion Derby, the Grape Run, etc. All these races, New Bedford half, all those, you know, we one of, one of the two of us were the first women to do them. And they would give us, I'm sure Nina got it too, I would get a bib number, uh, uh, official bib number, but it was marked across with a magic marker or whatever, unofficial. Uh, and of course, everybody thought that was a joke. And then if I finished, let's say, 10th among 15 men, I'd get the 10th place trophy, but they had, they would give Catherine the unofficial 10th place trophy now, and everybody would laugh. It was, it was great fun. So it made a statement, but it made a good statement. Speaking of publicity, um, there was a lot of publicity that went into this moment here, and we're going to bring up two more people uh, who were involved in this day. Nina Cusick, will you please join us? Well, we had to start a different starting mine or mine. 